Welcome to the Berkshires Gone By, history and folklore about the westernmost and most beautiful county in Massachusetts. I'm your host, Brooke. At Sky Farm, in the northern span of the town of Mount Washington, Massachusetts, tucked into the southwestern corner of our beautiful Berkshire County, two little girls were growing up, as little girls tend to do. Elaine and Dora Goodale were born three years apart, Elaine in 1863 and Dora in 1866. Their parents, Dora Reed and Henry Goodale, were both writers who valued education, and both came from families with long roots in early Berkshire settlement and colonial America. Henry was born in Egremont. His parents are buried in the Mount Everett Cemetery there. Their beautiful monument is a towering column topped with an urn out of which burns a stone flame. Henry served on the State Board of Agriculture and was not only a writer but a poet. Elaine and Dora also had two other siblings, a sister, Rose, who would become the family historian, keeping much of their works preserved, and a brother, Robert. Elaine and Dora loved to write, almost as soon as they were old enough to hold a pen. Before they had even left the farm, the inspired girls had already had numerous works published. But the little girls grew up, and Elaine left to attend Smith College, and it was at about this time the two girls' lives diverged. Let's follow Dora first. As her sister was away attending to her studies, their parents found that their relationship no longer worked. At the time, divorce was a dirty word, but they were open-minded people who didn't wither at the judgment of others and who weren't in the habit of kidding themselves. Dora was sent to a boarding school in New York City for one year while her parents figured out how best to separate. After everything had been settled, she returned from the bustle and congestion of late 19th century New York City to her mother, as did her brother and little sister, to Sky Farm in the beautiful rural wilds of Mount Washington, Massachusetts. Her father had just about traded places with her, going to the city and opening the Windermere Hotel, a boarding house for financially independent working women, as at the time it was not seen as respectable if a single woman were to stay in a hotel that also housed men. But back in the Berkshires, the farm became too much for the little foursome to handle on their own, and her mother made the difficult decision to move them to Redding, Connecticut, where she had some extended family. A little while later, they moved again to Northampton, Massachusetts, to be closer to yet another group of her family, and also the location of Smith College, in which Dora soon enrolled, shortly after her older sister Elaine's graduation. She focused on art at school, but never stopped writing or publishing works. While in Northampton, she met a young man named Thomas Sanford. It was understood that they would someday marry, but that never happened. And in the few months after her graduation, in 1891, they moved again, this time to the east side of the Connecticut River, Amherst, Massachusetts. Her father had built and owned a small house there, and it would save them money to reside in it but he still stayed in the city. However, when fire broke out and burned the little structure to the ground along with everything they owned, including many works both unfinished and finished of her mother's and her own, they headed back, heartbroken, to Redding, Connecticut. Dora soon took a job at the Samford School and worked there for quite some time to help support her family, especially her mother, who seemed to be steadily weakening. Then. In 1910, Dora the Elder died. Three years later, Dora was offered a job at the Pine Mountain Settlement School in Bledsoe, Kentucky. This could have been because of the educational link between the Pine Mountain School and Smith College. It was the school's grand opening, so she stayed with Pine Mountain for a year, helping to establish it, before switching gears and becoming a secretary at the Pleasant Hill Academy Upland Sanatorium. She took great interest in making sure people had books, 
Reading and enrichment of the mind could heal the soul as much as medicine the body. She later became the director of the sanatorium. It was her intent not only to heal patients, but also to change their habits in life to those that would keep them healthy long after their stay. She fell in love with the people, the place, and the way of life in those rugged mountains. She even wrote stories and poems in the local dialect. Her book, Mountain Dooryards, was published when she was 75, but she was weakening, and so lived with her brother, who'd been living in Virginia for a time. But Robert was no spring chicken either, and just after 1950, she was moved to a nursing home. At the age of 87, she passed away on December 12th, 1953. She was buried by friends and family in the Reading Center Cemetery in Reading, Connecticut, and the spot marked with a rather humble stone. Now we'll rewind time again and follow Elaine. Last we heard, she had just left for Smith College as her parents began to plan their separation. Elaine graduated Smith in 1884, but all during her college years, she and her sister still collaborated to find publication and were successful with Scrubner's Monthly, Sunday Magazine, St. Nicholas Magazine, and Harper's. Elaine also published a book called The Journal of a Farmer's Daughter about her experiences growing up in Mount Washington, Massachusetts. Almost instantly after graduating, she left Western Massachusetts for Virginia to teach. It was at the Hampton Institute that she found herself confronted by the Native American world. The Hampton Institute was a historically black school, but it had opened its doors to Native Americans during an era in American history when it was thought that converting natives to white culture was the best thing for them, a way to save them from extinction through their own ignorance. An absurd idea today, but there were a lot of absurd ideas long ago. It was her job to educate a group of 100 young Western Native Americans. Elaine found this challenge disconcerting. She didn't see it as enough to simply teach them how white people lived and the way white people learned. She wanted to be able to relate to these young people and really understand where it was they were coming from in order to teach them about the world that invaded their homelands in a way that would really mean something to them. But could a woman, practically just out of her teens herself, and raised so far from all these native traditions, ever hope to understand them? Well, she wasn't about to not try. So as soon as she had time, in 1886, she made her way by wagon and by train to the Sioux Reservation that was home to many of her students, and tried to absorb as much information as she could about their lives there. She helped found the Indian Rights Association and worked hard to become fluent in every Sioux dialect. She eventually became so trusted that she was even included in tribal meetings. She in fact learned so much about their way of life and the struggles they faced that she didn't want to leave. That same year, she was given a teaching position at the White River Camp, again tasked with the education of Native children. Elaine quickly organized a day school and went to work teaching. Her belief was that everyone deserved an education but it should at least be in their own hometown. There was no need to separate people from their own cultures and little reason to send children all over the country to learn. The Bureau of Indian Affairs gave her the job of superintendent of Indian education four years later for the Dakotas. On December 29th of 1890, American troops were sent to a Lakota camp to disarm them as they began to be perceived as a threat. A disagreement over the confiscation of a rifle from a deaf Lakota escalated into the wholesale slaughter of over 150 men, women, and children, and 51 were wounded, some of whom died later. The Lakota fought back, and 29 troops were killed, 39 wounded. A few of the troops were even shot by friendly fire in the chaos of the battle. Lakota who escaped sought help from other tribes and missions nearby. Elaine took up the mantle of nurse and worked alongside Dr. Charles A. Eastman. Soon afterward, they began courting, and during a trip to New York together to visit her father, they wed in 1891. Dr. Charles A. Eastman 
was a Santi Sioux, with some part European ancestry from his mother, who had some small part European ancestry from her mother. His mother passed away after giving birth to him, but he spent his first few years living amongst his tribe with his father and siblings, before a local war forced their separation. After reuniting with his father, some 15 years later, 15 years that he had spent living with his grandmother and cousins, he found that his father had converted to Christianity and had taken the name Eastman. He too decided to convert and chose the name that he had upon first meeting Elaine. Charles Alexander Eastman. His father thought it was terribly important that Charles receive a European-style education, and Charles seemed to take to it like a fish to water. He didn't just attend one school, no. He attended Belvoir College, Knox College, Dartmouth, graduating in 1887, and in 1889 graduated again from Boston University with a degree in medicine. He was one of the first natives to do so. After they married, the couple began having children, six in all, five girls, and a boy. Florence was first, but the date of her birth wasn't well documented because of the family's remoteness in the West. Dora was born in 1892. She was named for Elaine's sister and mother, and was given the middle name Winona, which was the name of Charles's mother, who had passed away just after giving birth to him. Charles's first native name, I say first because Native Americans had, and some still have, a tradition of changing names with the accomplishment of major milestones in life. His first name as a baby was Hakara, and meant pitiful lass, because he would grow up not knowing her. Their third daughter, Irene, was born in 1894, daughter Virginia in 1896, and Charles Alexander Eastman Jr. came along in 1898. And finally, Eleanor was born, just the other side of the new century, in 1901. The family moved back to Massachusetts in 1903, but times were tough for a bit. Charles may have been smart as a whip and considered quite handsome and genteel for the time, but white Easterners didn't seem to want to frequent his medical practice. To make ends meet, they moved again to Pennsylvania, and both worked for the Carlisle Indian School. Charles's relationship with his wife opened a door for him. She encouraged him to share the stories of his youth with the wider world, who might not understand his ancestral culture, by, of course, writing about it, just as she had. His articles found interest and publication easily, especially with Eastern audiences curious about the seemingly mysterious native cultures. With these newly acquired funds, the family again returned to Massachusetts and lived in Amherst. It was from this location that Charles's books and lectures really took off, and they found financial security. His stories entranced readers and audiences, hungry for more. He thought that both his education proving that a native student given as much chance as anyone else could arise to great things, and his documentation of the lives and struggles of the native population through writing could open the eyes of the world to the injustice against, as well as the value of, native culture. He even helped create the Boy Scouts of America and 32 Native American chapters of the YMCA. He worked for numerous presidents in Indian affairs of one nature or another. This episode really isn't about Charles, but I thought that I'd also add that there's even a crater on the planet Mercury named after him. In reality, Elaine did quite a bit to help her husband write, one reason being he was no good at typing. Despite raising six children, working on her husband's projects, and running a household, Elaine never stopped writing her own works as well. They even opened a summer camp in nearby New Hampshire in 1915. But the couple began to suffer some problems in their relationship, and when their daughter Irene died in the 1918 influenza epidemic that swept the world and killed over 50 million people, the cracks became more obvious. Irene had been a talented singer and was making quite a name doing both modern and traditional native songs. She was buried on a hill overlooking a lake and in the traditional Sioux custom. Three years later, Charles cheated, and may have fathered a child with another woman. Elaine left him, but they never divorced. Charles never wrote again. It seemed he just couldn't write without her. Writing seemed therapeutic for Elaine, however. 
or perhaps it worked to distract her from her troubles. Either way, she didn't stop. Charles, her estranged husband, spent the remainder of his years summering quietly in a rustic cabin beside the waters of Lake Huron and spending winters with his son in Detroit. January 8th of 1939, Dr. Charles A. Eastman suffered a fatal heart attack in that city. His body was buried at the Evergreen Cemetery. He was 88. When her son told his mother that her husband had passed away, Elaine put down the pen and never wrote again. But she did publish a few things she'd written before his death. In her elder years, she published what are believed to be the most important works on the changing world of the Native Americans of the Plains, the articles Wounded Knee Massacre and Ghost Dance. Elaine still felt, after all those years, that her writings and notes, even those that weren't published, were worth something. And so, after editing Charles out of most of it, she donated the lot to Smith College. Elaine passed away on the 24th of December, 1953, at the age of 90, only days before her younger sister Dora. Her children and grandchildren laid her to rest in the Spring Grove Cemetery in the village of Florence, part of the town Northampton, Massachusetts. During her years working to serve and promote the native cultures, she was given the nickname Sister of the Sioux. Both Dora and Elaine lived lives that led them to unveil little-known cultures hidden to the rest of the country. They strove to teach the disadvantaged and to level the playing field for countless youngsters, thus bettering the whole of their communities. They both documented in beautiful prose their experiences growing up and living in those quickly changing times and they both left their words behind for as long as anyone cares to read them. You can read them right now if you wish, because much of their work is online, for free. They are available to read and some to listen to at archive.org or to listen to at LibriVox.org. Some of Dr. Charles Eastman's works are available there as well. Not too shabby for a couple of Berkshire girls, I must say. It makes me proud. I'd like to go out on a little poem. Dora wrote, A health to old Berkshire, to honor-crowned Berkshire, to broad-bosomed Berkshire, who beckons us all, in camp or in court, or as fortune may find us, like children we turn to the purple-topped dome. We go there we must, but our hearts are behind us. Thy name is of childhood, thy breath is of home. The long shady street in our dreams we remember, the smooth sloping orchard, the vine metalled wall. In dreams we return with the snows of December to sound hearted Berkshire, who waits for us all. Then here's to old Berkshire, to old happy Berkshire, to sound hearted Berkshire, who waits for us all. This has been The Berkshires Gone By. Created, written, directed, and read by myself, Brooke Renier, and co-produced by Deanna Garner. You can find more episodes like this one on Facebook and on YouTube. If you'd like to see more pictures related to our shows, or just pictures of the Berkshires long ago, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram, or visit our website at www.theberkshiresgoneby.com. We hope you'll join us for our next episode. Thanks for listening.